Howdy. Howdy. Do you ever watch her show and say, oh, I so relate to that? Maybe the character is going through something difficult that you've also gone through before. And what could be better than serving up smiles? Being dead or anything else. For me personally, I tend to relate to Spongy a lot of the time. Throughout the years, I think he's gone through a lot of problems that many people can relate to. So is Squidward, so is Sandy. So today, I'd like to talk about what I think are the most relatable episodes in the series. Whether it be insomnia, social media problems, or even earworms. Anyway, let's talk about the 10 most relatable SpongeBob episodes. To me, anyway. Hmm? Well, we don't always have to have a skip, boo. Sometimes we can just be juggling and hanging out. In Spongiac. Have you ever had sleeping problems? I definitely have. And SpongeBob goes through exactly that. You see, Krabs has managed to convince SpongeBob that he's an insomniac. That's it! You're an insomniac! An insomniac? Why? Why? Because he was 1% over the normal amount of mustard he applies. Oh, at this rate, I'd be broken! 411 years! And as usual, because of his anxieties, Spongebob becomes his own worst enemy. This small shadow of doubt Krabs has given Spongebob makes him become terrified of not getting enough sleep. Thus, like many people, he becomes so anxious about not being able to sleep that he can't sleep. I swear, anyone that goes through this, the irony might have been funny once, but it's just not funny now. In the past, I've definitely had this problem too. When my brain is busy ruminating on everything, I just start questioning everything. In this case, SpongeBob starts ruminating on, is his pillow too hot? Is there anything else he can do for himself to help him sleep better? How many hours till he needs to go to work? Four hours, 59 minutes, 50 seconds. Four hours, 59 minutes, 45 seconds. 4 hours, 59 minutes, 41 seconds. His brain is so busy fretting about not sleeping, suddenly sleep eludes him. And of course, he runs into one of the most common anxious thoughts of all. What if I don't get to sleep at all? Spongy, between us, I'll tell you what's personally helped me. Instead of worrying about how long you're unconscious for, Perhaps you could remind yourself that simply lying down and deep breathing is still very good rest as well. Chances are, even if you only get a few hours sleep, you'll probably still get through your day just fine. I mean, I've run many 4am ultra marathons in the past on zero hours sleep. I don't think anyone sleeps before an ultra marathon. How can you? Chances are, even if Spongy sleeps badly, he'll still catch up on his sleep the next night. Maybe he should have just lay in bed and read a book. But of course, continuing to be an anxious sponge, he goes to Patrick of all people. Why Patrick? What in your history together has ever indicated that Patrick is a good source of information for anything? At first though, it looks like they've stumbled on a good way to combat insomnia and anxiety, lying down and reading a good book. Unfortunately, this is Patrick we're dealing with, so he reads one of the most high-strung, excitable books he could find. He then of course gives Spongebob the absolute worst possible thing he could give him when he's trying to sleep. Caffeine. Coffee. Generally, cola, energy drinks, coffee and tea should be all avoided at least 8 hours before you go to sleep. Spongebob then covers another really good way of getting a good night's sleep, getting some daily exercise. Whether it be a walk outside or in Spongy's case, a run, it can be a really helpful way of getting a good night's rest. And finally, Spongebob crashes into one of his more demented dreams. Seriously, this demented trip he has is definitely one for the Sponge books. In the end, I would have liked to see Krabs get his just desserts for overstressing his most anxiety prone employee. And the ending's a bit meh with SpongeBob just crying mustard onto patties. But despite this, I think the episode would still be very relatable to many people struggling to get a good night's sleep. Please let me sleep for just five minutes. Number nine. <laughs> Bulletin board. Wow, this actually feels closer to representing the social media roller coaster than just about any other show I've seen. It almost feels like Bikini Bottom is creating their own Twitter, but it feels as humble as ever since it's all told through a bulletin board instead. A community bulletin board set up at the Krusty Krab. A bulletin board for the community! See, in theory, I think that's a beautiful thing. And I like how humbly the show has broken the basic idea of a bulletin board. Fundamentally, it's just meant to be a place where everyone can express their opinion. And the idea of this is appealing and beautiful to SpongeBob. Community. 
But you can bet your five Danish crones this board is eventually going to be used for misinformation and hurting people. At first though, things seem to be going well. For example, Pearl draws a picture and puts it up on the board, and people leave notes saying how nice it is. But then we get our first not so positive critical comment. When I eat at the Krusty Krab, all I get is a dark, empty feeling inside. P Star 7, ouch! P Star 7? Who on earth could that be? I don't know, it's a mystery. Unsurprisingly, Krabs wants to take this negative comment down, but this guy here has an opinion on that. The community bulletin board is for everybody. You can't just take something down because you think it's bogus. Well, I hate to be that guy, but technically Krabs can take it down since he's a business, he's not a government. If a government takes down a post they don't like, such as a Chinese post against the Communist Party, that is censorship. However, if P-Star starts, say, raving in the Krusty Krab that Krabs puts poison in his burgers, technically Krabs can have P-Star removed from the property, just as Twitter can technically ban someone if they want to. Because they're a business, not a government. It just feels like censorship because they're so freaking huge. Now, I'm certainly not pro-censorship. I just wanted to clarify what censorship actually is. Anyway, SpongeBob agrees that all the bulletin board's notes should be kept up. But apparently, P-Star is a troll. He immediately just responds by just making fun of Spongebob. And as you can imagine, things just escalate from there. I want to express the worst side of myself. <laughs> Why not? And don't forget to feed your hatred with a selection from our menu. I think so many good points are made here without feeling excessively preachy. How social media can potentially affect our anxiety in the real world. How the loudest, angriest, most contrarian posts can often get the most attention. How giving attention to this sort of behavior can validate it and thereby encourage it in other people. And of course, when people take what's on the board as fact. Hey, it's on the board. And the board is never wrong. And finally, it all dawns upon Spongy. This bulletin board has become a bullying board. But I like that the episode finishes off with Spongy and Patrick talking all about it in real life, face to face. But equally as importantly, in the end, the crew does the smart thing and they walk away from the bulletin board and do something else. In this case, knitting. Personally, I'd take a walk or maybe go outside and juggle somewhere nice. Maybe have a barbecue. <laughs> I don't know what you call this style, Boo, but uh, looks kind of neat. Yeah. Abrasive side. Have you ever found yourself feeling a little bit bitter about the world? Finding it hard to keep a friendly, positive outlook. Yeah, after the last few years, I imagine we're not alone in that. I think in most people, there's another side to us. A side that wants to get angry and lash out at your friends. A side that sees the bleaker, negative side of everything. At least for me personally, I find that pretty relatable. I feel like this episode gives a voice to what can happen to people when they suppress their anger and frustration, until eventually they just explode and become bitter at others. SpongeBob expresses this through his new abrasive side. The story is, SpongeBob is getting ready to go to Glove World with Patrick. They love this place. In fact, SpongeBob is so excited that he camps out at the bus stop. Man, I wish I could get half that excited about going to any theme park. But unfortunately, all the people in the town are being big jerks and cut in front of it. And unfortunately, since we're in Season 8, SpongeBob is still spineless spongy at this point. In fact, this may be the episode of Season 8 where SpongeBob realizes he's become a spineless old goon. It's true that I can't stand up for myself! So obviously, he's going to tolerate this inconsiderate behavior. Honestly, I think I would have exploded one minute into this episode. I would have stood up and said, Hey, I was first. I was here all freaking night. Buzz off. But season eight, Spongy is just a punching bag. And then when he's just about to finally get on the bus, Sandy comes begging for his help. Gosh, Sandy, I'd like to, but I'll miss the first bus to Glove World. But this is an emergency. This is unusually inconsiderate of Sandy. I think she would know just how much Glove World means to SpongeBob. But this is season eight, so I shouldn't be surprised they're willing to compromise on character for story. And if this wasn't enough, as soon as SpongeBob finishes with Sandy, Krabs then demands his help. Then his grandma 
Denmark needs to go across the road, causing him to miss another bus. Well, well, that one is okay. I think he should have done that one. But apparently, now Patrick's back and he's angry at Spineless Spongy. Now brace yourself, because I do believe this is the first time in eight seasons that Patrick has ever given good advice to Spongebob. And probably the last. You need to learn to say no. Stand up for yourself, man! I know, right? Cherish this moment, because I can't remember any other time in Spongebob history where Patrick ever gives good advice to Spongebob again. Anyway, Spongebob realizes just how spineless he's become, and Gary orders him an abrasive side. And shockingly, it works. Abrasive side, abrasive side, and now I get it now. Hooray! Finally, we can say goodbye to spineless mid-season Spongebob. Honestly, at first I was so glad to see Spongebob finally stand up for himself, I didn't even mind that he was rude to his friends. But the greatest catharsis? When he finally stands up to Krabs. And this guy has had an abrasive side coming for nine freaking years now. Let's take a moment to all witness this together. I need you to work an extra 17 hour shift tonight. Sorry Krabs, I'm busy. Unless you're paying me overtime. Overtime? Maybe we're meant to feel like he's going too far? But honestly, I can watch Spongebob stand up to his friends when they push him around five times over. Eventually though, when Spongebob starts insulting Patrick, he finds himself isolated from his friends. But again, Spongebob standing up to Krabs asking him to work a 17 hour shift is a good thing. Maybe this is just a sign he needs to find a decent paying job where he's paid what he deserves. Unfortunately, in the end, Spongebob gets Sandy to rip off his abrasive side pretty sporadically. It's a shame Spongebob couldn't have compromised and instead switched to, I don't know, a non-scratch disc sponge. That way, Spongebob could have found a balance between standing up for himself and not rubbing his friends the wrong way. Pun intended. Anyway, even if I don't like the ending to this episode, it's still a very satisfying, cathartic episode. Overtime! Hey, dude, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Procrastination. And now, Pencil, get ready to do your stuff. Because here we go. Spongy has an essay to write, but he just keeps getting distracted. Not only are his thoughts and distractions relatable, but just the fact that he can't seem to get his thoughts on paper. I relate so much to this. As someone who does a fair bit of writing and research for scripts, I definitely get what he's going through. Spongy starts off well by sitting at his desk and preparing his writing tools. But he procrastinates endlessly and the words just won't come to him. But at the same time, I can't fully blame him. When you're in that moment, sometimes it can just be so tempting to do anything. Anything but the task at hand. Whether it be an essay, work emails, or maybe even just writing a story. Sometimes on these it just feels impossible to concentrate. I mean, I literally do this whole get the blood pumping thing at least two times before writing. I think another relatable aspect is he gets distracted by cleaning the house. With more people working at home, I do wonder if nowadays this problem happens to more people than before. I can't work on my essay knowing there's a mess in the kitchen. The sofa rapidly becomes more tempting to Spongebob as time continues to dwindle away. And then another relatable part hits us, which is Spongebob's anxiety starts creeping in. He starts ruminating and worrying about not being able to finish his essay, thus getting him even more distracted from finishing his essay. Soon, he's having nightmares of not being able to finish his essay and setting the house on fire. My house is on fire! Am I overanalyzing this, or does maybe Spongebob have a little bit of generalized anxiety disorder? <sighs> anyway, eventually he is finally able to come up with some ideas of what not to do at a stoplight. Everything he's been doing. And honestly, I would have loved to have read Spongy's essay, it sounds fascinating. Unfortunately, in the end, Spongy discovers that Mrs. Puff has of course cancelled the essay. But I think the unspoken silver lining here is Spongebob learned a lot of self-discipline from this experience. I reckon from now on he's going to handle essays much better after this happened to him. In the end, he finally overcame his procrastination and wrote the essay. In case this has ever happened to you, I'll share with you what has personally worked for me. If you have your own tips, feel free to leave them in the comments. Personally, if I'm procrastinating, I'll say, try writing for 10 minutes and if you can't keep writing, that's okay. And many times later on I've looked up at the clock and realized I've been writing for an hour or two. 
and obviously minimize your interaction with social media when you're writing. Maybe even keep your phone on silent. You and I both know that you're just using me as a distraction so you don't have to write your essay. That is not true. Number six. Earworm. Ever had a song stuck in your head playing over and over again? Of course you have. Chances are, if you're watching this, you're a homo sapien with an 86 billion neuron brain of your own. And sometimes songs have a tendency to get wedged in those brains. Oftentimes when we don't even want them to. Think of, say, that stupid shark song, Hokey Pokey, or It's a Small World After All, and you'll probably get what I mean. You see, SpongeBob has been continually listening to a new song he likes called The Musical Doodle. Round and round the record spins all day. Listen again, it takes you far away. Fortunately, probably for our sanity, the song actually isn't that catchy to anyone but SpongeBob. That I know of, anyway. It's certainly not catchy to me. Spongy loves the song so much that he buys a recording of it. And apparently, Gary also doubles as a record player. Who knew? And Spongy proceeds to listen to the song over and over again all night. Personally, I can definitely relate to this. There have been times where I'll hear this new song and I'll just listen to it over and over again for hours on end. But anyway, when Spongy does this, you can probably guess what happens. Yep, Spongy's got himself one powerful earworm. And even when he's trying to sleep, he just can't seem to get that song out of his head. And what do you know, the next day after continually listening to the song, even the crusty customers can't escape the musical doodle. As you might have guessed, Krabs is not a happy crustacean. Stop singing that song! One more outburst like that out of me and I'm sending you home for the day! But as the day goes on, SpongeBob's sanity continues to deteriorate, trying desperately to hold back the musical doodle. Fortunately, his friends try to help out, and Sandy explains to us a really good way of getting rid of an earworm. The only way to drive the earworm out is with another kitschy tune. Sometimes this can be helpful if you have the earworm of a song you don't like, and you want to replace it with an earworm you do like. But if that doesn't work, Spongy could also try chewing gum. This is another well-known way to get rid of an earworm. Another method is he could have listened to the musical doodle one more time all the way to the end. As normally, it's a single part of the song that gets stuck in your head, and this is your brain's way of just finishing off the song. Anyway, I don't think there are many hearing people in the world that couldn't at least relate a little bit to this episode. Number five. Pizza delivery. If there's one thing that's memorable to me, it's remembering the old late night pizza delivery. For me to deliver to an address that becomes frustratingly difficult to find in pitch black. And that's exact. Well, yeah, I can wear my hat, sure. And that's exactly what happens to SpongeBob and Squidward here. But strangely, what I also remember is having SpongeBob's really positive work attitude towards pizza delivery. Sure, SpongeBob and Squidward are stuck in the middle of nowhere hunting this address down, but SpongeBob is doggedly determined to deliver this pizza to the customer. Who cares about the customer? I do. Well, I don't. <gasps> Since this is a classic episode, you probably already know the story. SpongeBob and Squidward just go on a harrowing adventure to deliver a pizza, and the time just goes on for them and it's just an exhausting address to find. In my pizza delivery years, I definitely worked with a few Squidwards, but I also remember working with a small handful of Spongebobs too. There's something that just feels so familiar about these two in a car just delivering a pizza together. The positive, cheery delivery guy, and the reluctant, begrudging delivery guy. But to be fair, Squidward's a real trooper in this episode. It's one of his best portrayals. He gets bopped around a lot, and he is just a trooper to the end. But pizza delivery also betrays something else that's really common on the delivery night nice shift. When you reach a customer's door, you sometimes get nothing but an insignificant complaint and a door in the face. Don't tell me you forgot my drink! But you didn't order any. How am I supposed to eat this pizza without my drink? 
And when this happens to SpongeBob, he takes it completely to heart. And only Squidward can stand up for him. Look, I told you, little friend, I ain't paying for that. Well, this one's on the... I think pizza delivery is an episode that highlights just how much our personal attitude towards a job can affect how much we enjoy it. Personally, on the long night delivery shift, I used to remind myself, hey, at least I'm making someone's night better. I get to listen to the radio and have some solitude. And like SpongeBob, that sort of thing helped me feel a little bit more grateful for having a night shift. Number four. <laughs> Rock bottom. I think many people have visited Rock Bottom at least once when they're kids. Lisa had a similar experience as SpongeBob in season nine of The Simpsons, where she found herself lost in a strange town she'd never been and nervous of everything around her. Both Lisa and SpongeBob reach that point after hours and hours where they just want a bus to take them home, even just to a town they recognize. I'd have taken five, 10 kilometers out. Just get me out of this place. I mean, realistically nowadays, people can just pull their smartphones out and use their Uber app. But back in the day, all we had was buses, overly expensive cabs, and street directories. And like we see with Spongy here, when you're in this situation, it feels like nothing goes right. SpongeBob does the next best thing and asks for directions. But he just can't seem to communicate with these people. He can't even seem to work out their genders. I can't understand your accent. Soon, a bus does arrive, but for some reason Patrick doesn't bother to tell SpongeBob that the bus has arrived. And he leaves without him, big pink jerk. How is this guy your friend still, Spongy? And poor Spongy is stuck all alone at night, waiting for his bus to arrive. Will it ever arrive? Hey! And as the episode continues, SpongeBob's frustration and dismay just continue to grow. He can't catch a bus, he can't ask for directions, he can't even seem to hold onto his balloon. And as the sun sets and the night turns to pitch black, frustration turns to panic. Have you ever been stuck at a bus station in a town you don't know at 11 at night, just desperately waiting for that last bus? The sense of fear and discomfort SpongeBob gets here really captures that. There just seems to be no way out of this strange town. Barnacles! But in the end, when I was hopelessly lost in these towns I didn't know, there was something important that I discovered, and that was the kindness of strangers. Um, excuse me, sir. Can you help me? When I was looking to go somewhere and asking directions, 99% of the time, people were really helpful. And the same thing happens for Spongy. Eventually, this mysterious red stranger does help him escape rock bottom. Sure, it apparently takes him till morning to get home, but hey, at least he's home. Seriously, did anyone else notice this? It's day when he arrives at his house, so I guess he was at rock bottom all night. As I said, nowadays, with the inventions of GPSs, smartphones, and Google Maps, I don't think this happens to people as often as it used to. But dang, Spongy getting lost in the rock bottom episode was really relatable to me growing up. Don't worry, SpongeBob, I'm coming back for you! And I think Spongy's third most relatable episode is... I had an accident. Have you ever felt concerned about going outside in the last few years? Yeah, funnily enough, many people have experienced at least a little of SpongeBob's anxiety here. But sometimes, as we can see from SpongeBob, this can turn into a full-on phobia of going outside. This is known as agoraphobia, and it's become tragically common. Like many people, SpongeBob has a traumatic event in this episode that triggers the agoraphobia. In fact, he has one nasty spill outside when he goes shell skiing. He basically shatters his derriere and has to go to hospital. Yep, you're a lucky, 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 lucky luck boy. He recovers, but the doctor does have a stern warning for him. One more injury like that, and you could wind up like that poor creature there in the iron butt. Huh, turns out the chocolate guy has an iron butt. Maybe it's from all that chocolate going to his thighs. Yeah, I remember my first Krabby Patty. Unfortunately, there are dangers everywhere that threaten SpongeBob's fanny, and he quickly develops agoraphobia. 
He's just too scared to go outside. I was wrong to go against nature. I'm a sponge! What was I thinking? Walking. My people are sedentary. On a side note, outside this episode, I don't often see Sandy and Patrick playing together like this. Certainly not without Spongebob. And from this, I can certainly see why Spongebob is Sandy's best friend. Like this? No, your other bottom! Don't you have to be stupid somewhere else? Not until four. She seems to more tolerate Patrick rather than actually enjoy playing with him. <laughs> Sorry. Needless to say, Sandy wants Spongebob outside living life again. But sadly, his phobia isn't broken so easily. They try to coax him out, but seemingly nothing will break his fear. Nothing's working, Patrick! What do we do? While this episode doesn't go through the realistic process of Spongebob slowly exposing himself to his fear more and more in order to conquer it, it does still cover the one thing that would get Spongebob immediately out of the house. Saving his friends from a guy in a gorilla suit. I did it! I made it outside! Nothing can stop me now! <laughs> Is it too late to go back inside yet? Sure, he gets ripped in half, but good on you for conquering your fears, Spongy. But say, if that hadn't worked for Spongebob, another option might have been if Spongebob had started on smaller goals and worked his way up. Sandy could have walked Spongebob down his pavement and then back in the house. The more Spongebob successfully walked out the door and allowed the fear to run his course, the less his fear would affect him and the more comfortable he'd feel outside. Who knows, maybe eventually Spongebob could take on two guys in a gorilla suit. George, they're onto us! <laughs> Let's get out of here. Number two. I want a bus to Bikini Bottom. Roller cowards. <laughs> this is so relatable to me, it had me in stitches. I am terrible at roller coasters. Like many people, I've been to the theme park with friends, and many times I've felt that social pressure to get on these scary rides with them. But every time I was terrified and hated it. Anyway. Spongebob and Patrick put in a similar situation here. Because they're going to their favourite theme park, Glove World. Because a new roller coaster has opened up. It's the fiery Fisco Pain! Opening tomorrow only at Glove World! But both of them are just as terrified of coasters as I am. But they don't want to tell each other because they don't want to disappoint each other. So they find excuse after excuse not to ride the roller coaster. The part that had me really chuckling though is when they ride the mitten. <laughs> this is the exact experience I had when I rode the miniature roller coaster, The Road Runner. It's the most tiny, pathetic roller coaster like this mitten, so I thought I'd be okay. But while my girlfriend Nin was laughing beside me, I was yelling in terror. I was petrified. And I got off that roller coaster looking very similar to these two. <laughs> there were people a quarter of my freaking age behind me, not even flinching. I'm sorry to go on about this, it just feels so relatable to me seeing someone else who is terrible with roller coasters. Spongy, we can be roller cowards together. Spongy and Patrick even go through that internal conflict I've felt so often, where by not going on the ride, I feel like I'm letting my friends down, feeling like I'm a coward. But even when I did go on these rides, I just felt like garbage afterwards, and I think you're meant to actually enjoy them. The reality is, some people just like roller coasters, and some don't. And not only is Roller Cowards really relatable, it's also really funny too. There's lots of interesting dialogue here, and we even get a fun cameo from the chocolate guy. One more time! You know, this is the line for the bathroom. Ah, we've gone eight times! For me anyway, Roller Cowards is one of the most relatable episodes in the Spongebob series. And before we get to number one, what? let's go through some quick honourable mentions. What? Squid's Day Off. I've expanded upon this one before in darker Spongebob episodes, so I left it off the list. But in case you missed it, this episode shows the endless cycle that can be obsessive compulsive thoughts, or just anxiety in general. It's all represented through Squidward. He tries to take a day off and not worry about leaving Spongebob alone at the Krusty Krab. He tries not to ruminate and worry on all the what-ifs in his head, like what if Spongebob sets fire to the Krusty Krab? And like with real OCD, the more he goes to check, 
the worse it gets. As someone with OCD myself, this episode is really relatable to me. Oh, what am I doing? Pickles. Now, I also talked about this one in Darker Spongebob, but probably the most interesting part I found about it is, I found people particularly on the autism spectrum tend to relate to this one the strongest. And being on the spectrum myself, I do get why. I've definitely found in the past I've gotten my words mixed up and found my anxiety is just causing me to struggle with very basic tasks. Even right now, I'm reading this script because for some reason my words and my anxiety is starting to get me jumbled up in what I'm saying in my words. Even that was a jumbled up sentence. Sorry. And this all happens to Spongebob to the point that he can't even put a basic crusty crab together. Krabs helps him recover in the end, but it was still a very relatable experience. It's like riding a bike. You never forget. The Bully. Hey, it's one of Flats the Flounder's first appearances on the show. Well, I like to kick people's butts. If you went to school and you were kind of introverted and a bit of a dork like me, well, chances are you had to deal with bullies. And this episode reminds the viewer that there isn't always an easy answer to this. And it also shows it's important you try to think of a solution. Don't just keep it to yourself. But most of all, I think the bully captures just how all-encompassing a bully can feel on a person's life. SpongeBob eventually becomes so uncomfortable and anxious that he's hiding in a toilet stall. We can see him going through the process of trying to understand what he did wrong. I find it interesting to see just how much this one person affects SpongeBob's life. That cheery sponge we knew is just gone. But I do love the ending comedic twist to this. In the end, it turns out fine for SpongeBob because Flats can't kick his butt because, well, Spongy's a sponge. You ever tried punching a sponge? Doesn't do much. Do you have any seven? <laughs> Take that, Spongy. Anyway, Wormy. One of the three most common human fears is fear of insects. And frankly, Wormy captures that sense of fear extremely well. Personally, I've always found butterflies more like glorified moths, so I don't get much joy out of them either. <laughs> Monster. <laughs> and for lucky last, Opposite Day. If you've been a kid, you've almost certainly played Opposite Day. And to demonstrate this, I'm going to do the rest of the honorable mentions in Opposite. Up until reviewing this, I have watched this episode in 20 years, but it doesn't feel relatable at all, and I barely remember this episode. It makes for a boring, uncreative premise to the episode, where no creative ideas could possibly come out from putting everything opposite. It's not a classic early season one episode. Definitely not. Anyway, let's not go on to number one. I hate opposite day balloon travel. And I think the number one most relatable SpongeBob episode is. You're welcome. The SpongeBob movie. In the past, have you ever felt insecure about liking kid stuff? Such as, I don't know, cartoons or Spongebob? If you've managed to get this far into my video about Spongebob, you can probably relate to this. But there's also a good chance that you already understand that as long as we're not hurting anyone, we can like whatever we want. It doesn't matter if you like kids stuff, as long as it brings you a smile and just interests you. Maybe even helps you be a better person in some way. I know Spongebob has certainly inspired me over the years. But most of all, I'm... Hey, settle down. I'm... Take it easy. I'm... What the scallop? I'm Goofy Goober! Anyway, you probably already know the story, but I'll just give you a quick refresher. Our adult spongy friend is feeling a little bit insecure about his maturity. Why? Well, he failed to get the job as manager for the second Krusty Krab that's opening. And Krab says he's not mature enough for the position. Yeah, apparently there's a second Krusty Krab here. That's right, folks. Longtime owner Mr. Krabs is opening a new restaurant called The Krusty Krab 2. By season 11, we still haven't ever heard of this second Krusty Krab again. But there's some speculation from viewers that this movie actually happens around the end of the series. So when SpongeBob's about 52 years old, in fact, you could call this Spongy's midlife crisis. Anyway, Spongy's journey to find Triton's crown actually just has a lot to do with him trying to figure out what a quote unquote man is. Now that we're men, we can do anything. Now that we're men, 
even though he's not particularly masculine in a 1950s sense of the word anyway. In the end though, Spongebob realises that being mature is not just about toughening up. It's not about being gruff and merciless. It's not about pretending not to be scared either. And it is certainly not about having facial hair. I swear his picture of being manly is straight out of the 40s. Anyway. Spongebob realises that being mature is more about facing stress and hardship with calm and confidence. It's about him being self-disciplined and not being controlled by his emotions. It's about him being confident in his ability to find the crown and save the day. Spongebob discovers that being mature is being proud to be a goofy goober, regardless of whether society says it's not manly or not. We don't have to be loud about our opinions, but it's okay to like what you like. And in 2005, this was a much less well-known message. Be it Lego, kids cartoons, kids games, whatever you like. I feel like a teen or adult watching Spongebob could relate to his journey. This movie has connected with me so much. To me, I consider the Spongebob movie to be the most relatable Spongebob episode. But I'd like to know, do you personally find any of these episodes relatable? Do you feel like we've had problems with our own online bulletin board? Or do you sometimes just procrastinate like Spongy does? Are you annoyed at the fact that I classified the Spongebob movie an episode? I understand if you are. Whatever the case, I always welcome your opinion and your thoughts in the comments below. Anyway, please look after yourself and each other. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. And I think the number one most bleh. And I think the number one most curses. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Oh, well done.